my talk tonight is going to be about my top eight NPM modules. Probably should have cut it to my top five, but that's all right. So we're going to go through kind of quickly questions at the end. Uh, there you go. My contact information, if you need to get a hold of me. I'm pretty much about anything at Trey Waters is probably me. I think my GitHub's Trey Waters. Uh, Google Plus, I got in pretty early, so I got my first and last name in there. So uh, definitely save questions till the end. I am on Twitter, not super active as of right this second, but I always check it. So if you have some ideas, just do a hashtag NPM10 so I can add those to my uh, kind of ideas for maybe the next time I do a talk or just things I'm probably personally going to use because I only have eight and that says 10. So uh, how many people use NPM? Just a show of hands. Sweet. Well, we're not here to shame. We're just here to like kind of, you know, collaborate and hug each other and all that good stuff, right? So uh, good, good. Uh, for NPM modules, what I have to say is it's all an investment of your time. It's not that you do or don't know anything. It's the fact that how much time do you want to spend in perfecting it? That's where NPM modules, in my opinion, come in handy. So when you're looking at an NPM module and trying to evaluate, is this one that I want to use, you kind of got to ask yourself a few quick questions. How many people are actually using this module, right? So you want to check the NPM downloads. How many people are downloading it today, last week, last month? That's a critical number. If that's zero, do you want it? So kind of evaluate that. Another thing is, is the module supported? And I rate that in terms of GitHub issues, not the number. How are they addressing those issues? Are those like low-hanging fruit that they could just kind of wipe up in one weekend? Or are these like critical issues that are going to affect you when you go to develop your application for a hobby or you know, enterprise level? The next is, is the module up to date? I like to look at the commits in terms of that. So when was the last time they made a commit? Not necessarily a good commit, but are they trying? Is somebody working on this? Is it something from last year? Is it something before the version of Node that you're working on? You know, these are all things to kind of keep in mind when you're looking at evaluating a module and investing your time, because my time's money. I assume all your time is money. Getting here costs money. These things are very important. So number eight. Uh, so number one is going to be what I consider the most critical. Number eight, not as super critical, but definitely something that I like to use. So moment, time zone. Uh, there's two actual NPM modules for this. There's moment and time zone. The key with the moment time zone is that it deals with time zones. There's daylight savings. There's little gotchas that you don't think about. So when I hit this, I was like, yes, I can do time zones, whatever. Got it, coded. And then I kind of hit this little thing with daylight savings time. There's a little bit with the 12 o'clock when it transfers over. Little weird gotchas. So moment time zone helps you deal with something that you don't have to think deeply about. You can just go ahead and move ahead uh, with your production. Parses, validates, manipulates time. So that's number eight. I'm doing little demos after each one that I pre-recorded. Uh, so sorry if you can't see the code. I apologize for that. I was like, great, pre-record this. Didn't think about resolution. So I apologize for the people in back. These slides will be available as a link that you can download for yourself and kind of look at the code, plus I have a GitHub at the end. So all this has been integrated together in a GitHub. You can kind of check it out, pick the code, or pick the code apart yourself. So with this one, we're looking at a, if I can get it. This is just going to show some actual code that you can kind of work around. Oh, there it goes. Uh, moment, just translating time, showing how you have end of daylight savings time. It does some cool things like two from end of year, how many months have progressed. Um, so I'll know that for the next one. So then we have number seven, uh, ACL. Node ACL is the name of that uh, NPM module. ACL is how it's coded. Uh, but in GitHub, it calls itself Node ACL. So don't really know why they have something 
conflicting there. But the key right here is authorization. So when I was uh, working with a database, I won't say the name at this point, but I was working with a database and I didn't realize that it had access control lists already because I was getting the person in. I was authenticating them. Authentication and authorization get confused a lot. Just kind of do a search on authorization and see what you pull up. It's not always authorization. It's kind of authentication is what they give you as search results. So that was a little disappointing because I'm like, I want to know who's the admin, who's the guest, who has rights to change this, who has rights to see it. That's what I was trying to get at. So I found this module, Node ACL, mimicked off of a Zen ACL. Uh, and it really helped me a ton. Come to find out my database does it, so I'll work on that <laughs> pretty soon. But um, authorization, authentication, really know the difference because your authentication is going to be your username and password. Authorization is going to be admin, guest, whatever, paid subscription, all that kind of stuff. And so Node ACL works really well with doing that for you, and it can get very granular. So if you want broad strokes, great. If you want something very specific, it can do that too. So we're just going to hope that when I click on it, it runs. Uh, the idea here is just a couple lines of code to require it, get it in. And then we have a test, or not a test, uh, add the person allowed to resources. That could be a, a blog or a route. And then right here, we're going to give them some roles. We can see that the website isn't running. I spool it up, uh, get my node service running with a little NPM start. Yay, it's going. Um, we're going to look at the database and just see there's nobody. Uh, ACL can connect to a database. I have it connected to my database right now. There was a count of zero right there, so there's nothing in the database to be dealing with access. In a moment, we're going to show in the database that we're going to have 11 records dealing with access. So here it was zero, here it's 11. So just in that little click that you didn't really see the full click, I was able to add the person with all their roles. Right here, we're going to test to see if a hacker can get in if they're allowed, and if I can get in, because I'm allowed, oh, sorry, allowed, allowed, there's a roll. So <clears throat> in here, we're like, ah, Trey Grisby, you're allowed. Yay, I love that, right? Uh, so we run, hacker is false, not allowed, uh, I am true. Just a little bit of code to kind of see it's not really complicated to get these things in and running um, for your own site. And that, you know, less than a weekend, a coffee shop visit to really get that going. Uh, so another thing that's important to me, number six, is going to be encryption. Um, at some point, you're going to have to deal with taking the person's data. It might be sensitive. You're not a credit card company. Some of you might be, but most of us aren't credit card companies. And you haven't gone through a lot of certification to be guru of security, right? So Bcrypt kind of helps you get things through your system safely, right? You can encrypt some data that is on your service, on your server, on your database, whatever. Think about encrypting that data. If somebody grabs it, if somebody hacks it, if somebody gets a hold of it, if it's in plain text, that's low-hanging fruit. They just take it and run with it, sell it to the highest bidder. If it's at least encrypted, they have to do some work. A lot of thieves aren't hard workers. So keep that in mind. Encrypt your data at some point. So I did it for my database. Um, I was taking in passwords. I wanted to slightly encrypt them. I'm not a super security wizard. I know the broad strokes, but I'm not into what's the latest, coolest algorithm to keep people out. And so I wanted an NPM module that at least helped me with passwords specifically. Oh, one thing. If you're working on a module, give me a really cool logo. I didn't have any logos for most of these people. so. That'd be awesome in the future. <laughs> I just made stuff up. So the code here is I have, uh, I'm just saving the password, just plain text, not doing anything to transform it. Um, showing you the web service trying to take this in. There's a password. That's all my stuff. Go through. Plain text just comes through. You're probably not thinking about this because it's just the environment you're in. But ah, we want to add a little bit of security. We're going to save that on our server for a moment. So let's hash it a bit. So what we end up doing here is pulling in bcrypt. We give it a little bit of salt for randomization. Bring it down a little bit. And then we're actually going to, with that randomized encryption, go ahead and encrypt the uh, password as a hash. 
the salt is truly for the encryption, uh, randomization entropy part of the encryption. And we, ha we salt the hash, which I totally laugh with my family who doesn't care anything about programming. It's like, I put salt on the hash. Like, what? <laughs> but it's encryption. They don't care. You know, that's the world I live in. But here is the encrypted password. So when a hacker gets that after infiltrating your database, security happens in layers, that's what he gets, he, she, whoever. That's a lot better than just having their password open. So number five, we got Mongoose. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm over my time, but we have Mongoose. So I work with NoSQL. Uh, I love NoSQL. I really like MongoDB. Mongoose is a great way to add schema and data validation to a MongoDB database. I just love it. It was my first one. I came from a world of uh, relation databases. So Mongoose didn't have a logo either. I just took their kind of what they had up there. So with this one, we're going to add a little bit of a Schema. So this is just all data that I'm getting back. I'm using a, a Google. So I got email, photos, gender, occupation, all that stuff. The key is I'm going to try and require a string for my username. And it is required. It must have a string in there or else I'm very upset. I might have messed up the slide. But the key is you can do that with the Mongoose in terms of the MongoDB <coughs> and connecting to MongoDB. There's all kinds of databases. There's caching. There's other modules that deal with that. I'm just talking about the ones that I enjoy and the ones that save me time. Um, I kind of come from the mean stack, if that's not obvious. So this was um, kind of a mean stack solution to deal with adding schema to your databases. So module number four, helmet. When we go out there into the internet, we need a little bit of security, just a little bit. It's not the force. It's that level below the force. Um, so with the helmet module, you can um, kind of pick on a few things that are very common in terms of uh, attacks on your server. This one gives you, by default, 10 um, sub-modules, I call them, uh, to deal with kind of attacks on your server. Seven of them happen just by implementing or initializing helmet. Um, they're just kind of, uh, I, I hate to say simple, but they're things that everybody should do just as a course of action. So by these two lines of code, you can implement seven, or sorry, kind of counteract seven HTTP vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting attacks, clickjacking, X powered by header, which kind of says you're uh, using this by whoever expressed, and then HTTP strict transport security, just saying next time that you hit my website, use HTTPS. Those are four, there's 10, seven are implemented with those two lines of code. The other three you really need to do customize, and they might not be worth the overhead to implement them. So really look at the 10 that they're trying to protect against and see if that's good for what you're doing in production. So another thing is, I come from the old school, I like logging. Everybody should like logging, right? You wanna see what's happening. When your user calls up and they say, it broke, What's it? I don't know, the thing you sold me, but it broke. You want to go back to a log, because you're like, OK, thank you, I'll help you. Pull out the log, deal with the details. Because for us, we are demons dealing with devils, devils in the details. We need details to do what we do to make them happy. Uh, Morgan is logging. You can save to file. There's a difference between developmental logging and uh, production logging. Don't get so verbose if you're in production. Um, I like to look at all my logging while I'm writing my code and kind of, I say compiling, but uh, running it on Node and kind of see maybe there's something unexpected so I can kind of dig into that and uh, deal with it more. So Morgan is what I use for logging. So Morgan has three kind of types that are just built in. You have a common type for logging. And if this is running, yay, which it is. Um, we're just going to kind of see what the common type gives you. So you spool up your web server, you do some kind of interaction on the web server, and then your logging starts to save some of the interactions that have happened. So this is the common type. It has a little IP address, you know, a little bit of information to get you going. That's great. We have another that we're going to try out, which is just tiny. Just a 
a little bit smaller, a little bit less, not so verbose. That's cool, depending on your environment. This can get really customized, and so there's a lot of flags in there to add way more that's in here. This is just kind of what I wanted to show you guys, and there's um, another one that we want to show you too. It's got some colors. All right, so our last one's just gonna show some color. Unfortunately, this is kind of one of my slowest sides. So uh, in the GitHub, there's a way to save this to file too, and it's kind of commented out here at the bottom. But uh, it works with FS stream and just save it to a folder and pull it up later. So this is one that gives us a little bit of color. It's not as cool, but a little bit of color to see what's happening. Of course, red, react on red, you know, something's really wrong if the colors are in red. So those are just three different types of uh, logging. So number two, we're getting really close. There's only one more after this, right? So I already gave it away. I'm a kind of a mean developer. I came into it maybe after a lot of you guys for sure. And so Express is what I use for my uh, web service. You can use uh, Happy uh, Koa, I want to say. What was it? Koa. There's other ones that you can use. This is what I use. And so really easy to get a web server open. You don't think about it until you have to code all those HTTP requests. Um, but this is really super helpful just to kind of get yourself out the door and get running. Um, and what I liked about it is I could make a REST API really easy. I was surprised. I'm like, what? That was a REST API? And I've been doing it ever since. So there's a bit more code in terms of getting the uh, Express going than we have seen already. I guess most of this was just to show you that there's a server running, um, but that's it. Require it, serve some static files up there with that, and then you're, you're good to go. And you didn't have to do all that work. That's really the key of what's going on here. So last one, number one, I'm sure everybody knows what's coming. How many people guess this one? One, nice, two. All right, I'm drinking two beers for that one. I'm very excited. <laughs> Right, okay, three. I'm drinking one beer. That's it. I'm going to just sobriety right now. So number one is going to be Passport. It's a website. Again, I admit that I'm not super guru in terms of security. I don't want to try and figure out what the hackers are doing tomorrow. I just want somebody to kind of work on most of it, 90% of it. I mean, your front door is not Fort Knox. Same thing with a website. It doesn't have to be Fort Knox, but lock the door. Kind of keep people out. So Passport, the beauty of Passport is it's designed with the idea of modularity. I like that because a lot of other people can work on building um, <clears throat> authentication for other websites for you. So they can, somebody else can work on Google. It doesn't have to be the guy who created this. Somebody else can work on Meetup. Somebody else can work on whatever, Twitter. And so I like that basic premise. How it's implemented, I would have had a way cooler application if it worked better. So right here, we do uh, local saving of usernames and passwords. You can connect to the uh, Google site, and it has a, or sorry, you can connect and authenticate with uh, Google. And it also has uh, built-in stuff for Express, really kind of designed to work with Express, so it can take that request, break it out, and pull some data from the request. So this one has a lot more code. We're going in the package JSON. It takes three modules to connect with Google, local, and just to use Passport. And then we'll kind of skip to the next one. So we go to the server. I'm using sessions. You don't have to technically use sessions, but a lot of this in here is just for the sessions, and this is security just on the sessions. Um, got some routes, not a big deal, and then express stuff at the bottom. I was really excited to make an HTTPS server that I uh, signed the certs myself just to work locally. Woo! It's the little things that get you happy. So here we're just working with a form, HTML, got to take the form in, I pass it through my front end as a function, but ultimately it could just be a, a REST request to the um, login, which Passport has a login. So login, registering a user, signing up a user, logging out, and then they have this little function here just for checking if the user should truly uh, be logged in, it gives you a true and false, whether they're logged in, and a little bit of information on top of that. Um, 
And then this part's going to be the Google side of it, linking to Google. So that was local. This is going to be Google. Um, I was touching their profile. So here we're talking about a route. So I, I did some persistent sessions on this one, so I have to serialize. I'm using their strategies is what it's called whenever they connect to another social media. So Google strategy, local strategy. Um, like I said, I was doing a persistent session, so I have serializing and deserializing over here. A uh, little bit lower. I was trying to save you guys from coding right here and dealing with bugs, but I probably could have cut out like a minute out of all this. So we're just trying to get to the social side of it. Local strategy. It's formulaic, too. So if you're going to write a module for a passport, very formulaic. You can just give it some outputs. You know what to expect, um, what you're connecting to. This is using OAuth 2, not for the local part. For Google, it's using Google's OAuth 2 authentication. It always wants a username and password, some callbacks. And I put the request as a callback up in front. Uh, a little bit of data. To... We want the Google strategy. There we go. So you, with Google, you have to give them a client ID, a secret, and a callback URL. It deals with that. I just put it in a separate file for separations of concerns. Um, <clears throat> but yep, so that's happening up there. Again, this formulaic. Uh, I think they use Java web tokens, I'm pretty sure. And so it wants that. Access token and refresh token gives you the profile on the profile uh, variable up there. And then a callback. Just a little bit of data that I'm going to get back uh, from logging in through Google. And we're just going to, pretty sure there's a ta da moment at the end of this, getting in a little bit of the data, messing with it a bit. Um, you can protect your routes. So for your REST API, you can protect your routes with uh, Passport. Right here is what does that, the function. It says, hey, if the person's there, go ahead and move. If the person's authenticated, move them on. If they're not, give them a 401 request. Deny them. Give them an error back. You can handle that however you want, you know, personal, uh, personal choice. Just protecting the route is all that's doing. But I thought I had a web page after this one showing what it pulls in from Google. So this goes and talks to Google, pulls in my personal information. And we're just waiting for the ta-da. Didn't happen. I apologize. I thought I recorded the last bit. So I went over to Google, pulled my information down. This is all up on GitHub if you want to check it out. I did not make the 15 minutes, sorry about that, but I did the best I could. Um, and I would love any participation. Hopefully some of you guys put up a little hashtag, uh, NPM10. All right, thank you, Trey. Cool, cool.